Hello, and welcome back to Wizard Kid. Today we're doing chapters three and four. Let's go. This time snakes. Except not yet. That, that'll be later. Yeah, so basically uh, Harry got locked up last time, and then he gets busted out this time. And I don't then know why I... they, uh, what? I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> Previously, no, I don't know. The, the, this um, is the, the worst beginning, but we're going to keep it anyway. So, I don't care. <laughs> let's get the boring shit out of the way. Um, okay. So, changes that are listed between the two versions, there's probably more than these. Um, when, like, when Ron says, like, you can't use magic, and Harry responds, like, pointing out the fact that he's in a flying car, uh, in the British version, he says, bit rich coming from you, but then they changed it to, you should talk, because I guess that was too difficult to understand, I don't know. Um, um bit rich, but okay. Yeah, it's like, it's not something that we'd really say here, but I don't think it's, you know something they needed to change um the uh you know moving the window was uh wound down changed to rolled down <laughs> the front of the car changed from windscreen to windshield um I mean, that, yeah that's just yeah. straight up like what a difference i don't think that one i was really aware of uh wellington boots changed into rubber boots and uh father christmas changed into santa claus which is a pretty common one yeah. Then here's one that I thought was weird. Um, when Percy like comes into the kitchen and he has like his prefect badge on, they describe it as being on a tank top in the British version, but a sweater vest in the American. Now, to me, those are two very different things. I would say they're very different things as well. So, as far as you're aware, a tank top could never be referred like that. That could not refer to. Like anything even remotely similar to a sweater vest, then? I don't think so. That I mean, they're both sleeveless, but that's about where the similarities end. All right. <laughs> so I guess he just is wearing a wife beater in the original version. Good to know. Come um, on. pulled the doors to, and then pulled the doors closed. I don't even remember what the context of that one was. <laughs> I don't either. Uh, here's a here's an instance of as does we have uh, oh. an apothecaries <laughs> turned into an apothecary. No, because it's not. I don't think it's wrong to to add an apostrophe s to the name of like say like a butcher's or a, a baker's or something. The baker's like that. opposite. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think I think that's fine here. It's just when it's just when people add it to the like names of stores that bothers me when they're not there. Yeah, let's go to Aldi's. Like, I, I don't get that. <laughs> um. Suppose. Again, I didn't mark down what this was uh, referring to, but uh, something was originally described as wonky and got changed to lopsided. I, I, oh, come I, on, you I like the word wonky. wonky. Like, I don't know why they changed that one. <laughs> and the uh, last one that's listed here is possibly the most baffling of all. Um, there's a sentence, uh, but it was a subdued group that headed back to the fireside in the Leaky Cauldron. It was group who, and then it changed to group that. Man. Like, this is just one of those instances where it's like, I guess they questioned the grammar, but, like, does that even really uh, the, count uh, as a version difference? It was like, how many changes you made? And they're like, um, I was just doing one right now. Uh... Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I, I love when they do stupid crap like that. And, um... I guess just to get this one out of the way also, uh, we didn't have many additions to the counters here, but we did have an instance of wheeling. Um, Ron had okay. gone a nasty greenish color, his eyes fixed <coughs> on the house. The other three wheeled around. I turned away, by the way. Was that too loud still? It was fine. Okay. There are also two named one-off characters, but we'll worry about those when they come up. Mm -hmm. Are we on to uh, our notes? Yes. You made fun of me for this first one. Cause... Yes, I did. <laughs> Because, like, I, I can't remember the exact context, but Harry's just like, what the... And I said, was Harry about to swear? And that's not me being like, oh, what did he say? Like, because I know it could just be what the... But what I'm saying is, is it, it... I was basically just asking, is it supposed to be implied that he was swearing and it got cut off? Or was it really just like a what the... Or like a what the heck or something? That's yeah, I, I don't know. It's like, to me, like, I, I saw that one and, of course, my... Like, I say, of course, as if, you know, everybody remembers every fucking facet of my life. But um, my uh, my mind goes to the 
instance in sixth grade where my teacher just went off on this massive tirade because somebody <laughs> said what the and she's screaming like what the is a swear it doesn't matter what you're gonna follow it up with like it's <laughs> did you, did it's you like go into some random tangent as well um, you're probably confusing it with the ego versus self actualization <laughs> story, which was yes, a different yes. year, different teacher, and okay. equally as baffling. <laughs> um, and it was weird because that teacher was insane, but the one who like got mad about what the usually had it together. The only other time I remember her freaking out over something was um, when people were saying foobar, and I don't think anybody knew what it meant. <laughs> She's just like, that is a bad word, you can't use that. And we're like, oh, well, shit, now we got to look it up and find out what it is. <laughs> exactly. So, Goodness. But yeah, so, basically, uh, the twins show up with Ron in the car. Um, I pointed out that Fred is the one driving the car, because last time... Oh, you got to make um, note of, like, when the twins are doing something different. Yeah, I want to I want to try to keep track of that to see if they have any, like, really noticeable personality difference. And in these chapters, they are pretty much always kind of doing the same stuff. Um, the only notable one I saw was that Fred was the one driving, which I guess fits with the sense that he's usually kind of the leader. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, th so, like, you know, they say that uh, we heard that, you know, you had, like, a you got, like, a reprimand from the ministry, blah, 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 we came to save you. And Harry's like, how did you know that? And he's like, oh, well, our dad works for the ministry. I have to question why he f was told this, like, unless it's just because it's Harry and Harry's famous, they're just kind of, like, maybe it's gossip going around. That might be part of it. I also figure it's because the Ministry is, like, really small, right? Because there's not that many wizards in England in the first place, like, in the UK in the first place. So the Ministry's got to be a tiny fraction of that. So it's probably only, like, you know, a couple hundred wizards at most. Maybe. Wizards and witches. But, yeah. So, yeah, there's this whole, uh... There's a whole escape sequence here. You've got some <laughs> notes on this. Uh, yeah, so, like, Harry's like, oh, you know, we can't use magic. And then Ron's like, oh, it's okay. We've got Fred and, I got, we got, I got Fred and George with me. And it's I like, know he... Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> like, that'll help. Yeah, like, they're 14. They can't use magic outside of school either. Like, I know that, I assume at least, that they were talking about, like, you know, we, we, we can work together to figure something out. But it just, the implication makes it sound like he's like, oh, well, we can't, but Fred and George can. Like, no, no, they can't. And they don't. <laughs> but yeah. yeah even yeah, even I, I, if I, they I, were of age, they couldn't use magic either. Like, because they still All they end up doing is just like pulling the glass off the window with the, with the car. And it's like, okay, I guess that's a trick. And Fred and George do, do like tricks and stuff. It's kind of up the alley. I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't then, know if I'd call it a trick as much as just, you know, they're, in, they, in they have resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a fucking snide comment here that's not really for the purpose of the podcast, but I just uh, wanted to let out my system, which is, uh, they, they keep mentioning, that Harry's like, okay, I can still hear Vernon snoring, the Dursies are still asleep, while they're fucking pulling the bars up the window, and I'm like, if this was my parents, they'd, well, my family, they'd fucking wake up from me whispering to Ron, or like from Harry and Ron whispering to each other. Yeah, like, I was, <laughs> I was reading this, I actually had a note originally, and I didn't keep it because you had that, just like, there's no fucking way that they slept through all this. <laughs> like, I don't know how loud this car is since it's like, but like, it's got an engine and it's revving and stuff. It's like, you know, right next to the house. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, they probably didn't, right? Like, they didn't what? Like, I mean, they eventually woke up. I assume it is because of the car. Like, eventually. They no, they actually, they specifically, like, what happened was... Oh, it's Hedwig, isn't it? Yeah, because Harry yeah. fucking ditched Hedwig, and she, like, screeches, and then that wakes up Vernon. I imagine it's gotta be the, like, it's gotta have been, like, the last straw. Like, maybe he was yeah. stirring awake. I don't know. Maybe. Um, and then there's a nice early indication here, which we go into a bit later, but this idea that, like, Arthur's attitude towards uh, muggles kind of rubs off on his kids because Ron and Fred and George are all like, oh yeah, lockpicking is cool and useful. And, you know, they basically see the value in having these non-magical skills. And obviously Arthur is also fascinated by that stuff, sort of in contrast to a lot of the wizarding world that are like baffled by it and don't care to understand it. They're like, no, oh, this stuff is cool. They have like a whole world of it. Yeah. I, um, I actually even kind of noted here that, uh, you know, I, I always thought it was just Fred and George are the ones picking the locks. But then uh, when... When they finally get Harry into the car and, like, everything, uh, 
Ron's the one that opens up Hedwig's cage, uh, like Fred hands him the pin or whatever. So I guess Fred and George probably taught him the trick too, which I mm-hmm. thought was kind of neat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it, it, this whole pro, like this whole section is just derpy where, you know, it's like they, they come into the room and it's like, okay, we're going to go get your trunk under the stairs. You got to be super quiet and everything. Like, you know, you, while we're getting that, you hand Ron the other stuff. So Harry is handing him stuff. I have to assume it's probably just like some dirty clothes or something. Cause like dude's locked up in this room. He barely owns anything. Like <laughs> all of his wizard stuff is under the, is like in the cupboard. So like, I want, I want to know what the hell he's handing Ron that is so important that he just totally forgets about Hedwig. Because, <laughs> like, they get everything else in, and then they're just like, alright, let's go, and then she's just like, ah. <laughs> But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, they escape. There's the whole bit with, uh, you know, Vernon runs in and, like, grabs his leg and shit, and in the movie, he, like, falls out of the window. It doesn't happen in the book. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, they kind of they get caught up. Harry tells him about the stuff with Dobby and all that, and um, they're talking about the Malfoys because they're like, well, you know, who might have... Th- th- there's this whole bit where it's like, oh, well, maybe they sent Dobby as a prank, and I, it's like kind of a shitty cop-out that they're just like, oh, yeah, we're just going to ignore this plot point for now. But um, Yeah, and like... Oh, I think it was maybe a little bit out of order. I... I no, I'm kind of, I'm coming back to that. Okay. But um, but yeah, so they met they they talk about that stuff and you know they're bringing up the Malfoys, and uh, Fred and George know about Lucius Malfoy because their dad is constantly complaining about him, and um, they say uh the actual quote is, when you know who disappeared, Lucius Malfoy came back saying he'd never meant any of it, <laughs> and within that context, that is like the stupidest. Like, you know, yeah, you know, yeah, Wizard Hitler disappears, and all of his followers are like, uh, you know, we we didn't really mean it. (laughs) Um, It's like, you know, we find out two books later that a lot of Death Eaters were claiming that they were under the Imperius curse, and so that's probably what they meant here, but because that piece of context is missing, it just sounds really fucking stupid. Yeah. (laughs) Um... So, so yeah, so they're talking about, about the Malfoys and about Dobby, and they, they sort of reach uh, an actually correct conclusion here, but through faulty logic, where they're like, oh, why, why did Dobby show up? And they're like, maybe, um, you know, Malfoy sent him as a prank. Maybe the Malfoys own Dobby. And the Malfoys do own Dobby, but they had nothing to do with set. Like, Dobby went on his own. That Those are completely unrelated things. Right. Um, <laughs> aside from, obviously, Dobby having heard about... Well, I mean, we, we know that... Uh... Only rich assholes have house elves, and they're right. the only rich assholes. So, God, yeah, I mean, fair enough. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, we uh, I, I mentioned here we plant the seeds of Perny's Perny's Percy's chronic <laughs> masturbation arc. Yes, it's they they always have such a terrible way of mentioning this, like. Oh, you know, uh, Percy's just been locked up in his room all the time. You can only polish your badge so many times. I don't know what he's doing in there. It's like, oh god, <laughs> like, and like, it, I can, I think it keeps getting worse throughout the book. Like, yeah, and, it, I, and there's uh, basically I, no payoff. Like, we find out eventually. You know, he has a girlfriend, right? That's like the whole. Yeah, that's it. The like, there's, the, there's I, nothing I, I, else I like to legit- it. I, every time I like go back to this story uh, or like read about it or whatever, even I always forget that this is even a plot point that they're like trying to plant this mystery. Like, oh, what's Percy doing? It's just, he has a girlfriend. That's it. <laughs> Very boring answer. Yes. Yeah, it, it has no relevance to anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so you know, Harry's meeting with the family. Ron and stuff gets in trouble. We'll talk a bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, you know, he's talking to Arthur, and Arthur's, well, or at least they hear, oh no, sorry, you, they, you've jumped ahead a lot. Sorry, I, I, I was trying to remember the context of this, I, I guess I misremembered. Um, sorry. I guess Harry's hearing about Arthur in the car. Yeah, and, they're just talking about, you know, the job at the ministry and stuff. Yeah, so they mentioned, like, oh, you know, he he's in the uh, 
misuse of muggle artifacts like department he you know it's it's just him and this old guy called perkins in there yes which so i will mention i had to check if perkins was a was a I checked as well. one off and he's not he does come back like you see him a couple times and he's often he's often referred to as being like the owner of the like magical expanded tent um and they're they very consistently refer to him as having lumbago which i had to I look up and that's just lower back pain oh, okay I mean, yeah, he's he's old. Fucking, I get a lot of back pain sometimes. Anyway, also, Professor um, Binns calls Harry Perkins at one point. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I enjoy uh, yeah that you know two people to handle all of these cases. That's that's definitely enough. I'm sure they're not overworked. I mean, they they say they're overworked, but like, who the hell thinks that's a good idea? I don't know. Oh, um, yeah. Also, this is extremely random and has nothing to do with the book itself. But I put artifacts in with an E. Um, because that's the British spelling, and it, Google Docs was like, "Do you mean artifacts with an I?" And I'm like, "No, I mean E." And then I checked my copy just to be like, "What does it say here?" It actually does have an I in my British copy, so hmm. I don't know. It, and just to clarify, like your version does say Ministry for Magic, right? Not Ministry of Magic. Because uh, I remember, I like, we discussed that last time, and I was like. I thought that it was that way, but I think you said that it actually wasn't. Uh, yeah, I'll have to try to find. So, while you're looking that up, um, yeah, so they're, they're talking about the... Ministry of Magic. That's weird. I wonder if they change it in later books, because I... Every time I, like, look at stuff online, they always treat, like, you know, the original British version as, like, the true canon, and it's always like, oh, you know, it's Ministry for Magic. It's like... Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure this is a relatively early print. The book only mentions Philosopher's Stone existing, so it's weird. Like in the, but um, see, so yeah, you know, they're talking about uh, Arthur's job and stuff, and they're like, he works in the most boring department. It's just misuse of Muggle artifacts, and I'm just like, I feel like that definitely cannot be the most boring department, especially from a kid's perspective, who's going to have no interest in like you know, lawmaking and, like, <laughs> treasury and that type of crap. It's like, you right. know, you you get to deal with weird, wacky shit, so... Yeah, I, I can imagine a whole book about Arthur's fucking adventures going off trying to, you know, solve these cases. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they tell a story about, <laughs> like, you know, there was this tea set that uh, was owned by, you know, a wizard, and then it ended up in the hands of a muggle, and it was, like, spraying boiling tea everywhere, and, like, these <laughs> sugar tongs got clamped on someone's nose. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> this is not boring. But uh, that also makes me question, like, is this just a case of, like, you know, these things were enchanted to, like, it, it would boil yeah. the tea on its own or whatever, and then the magic just got bad over time? and started breaking down or were they just intentionally made to do stupid shit from the start like because if they were then that would be whimsy but uh yeah that, that's a that's another in many in a series of many things that would be good questions to ask jk rolling about this series yeah um um uh, I, I don't have this in the notes here but um i just like remembered while you were talking about the tea set like they i think I can't remember if it's now or later, but it's mentioned that, um, like, Arthur had to do a bunch of memory charms on people. Um, oh, yeah. That's, that's, like, foreshadowing for later, because memory charms become, like, relevant in the book later on, so, yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. I think this is our first instance hearing, hearing about them, and mm -hmm. that's a whole, you know, conversation on its own about the um, legality or, what would, what would just, like, the... Ethics? Yeah, th basically, yeah, just, you know going around erasing people's memories for your own convenience. Right. <laughs> um, we kind of talked about that in the first book where Hagrid's like, ah, we have to keep secret, otherwise muggles will want magic solutions for all their problems. It's like, yeah, okay, that's what government's for. Like, <laughs> So, um, I went ahead and uh, I checked this stuff because in the last book there were, you know, we, we, we had to be super nitpicky about Hagrid driving the flying motorcycle from place to place and i'm like how long is this is he taking a stupid route i gotta know so i'm like okay the the weasleys are in a live in a place called ottery saint catchpole which is an extremely british sounding name i love it <laughs> um it's not a real place but uh 
Canonically, it's in uh, Devon, which is in the southwest. And oh, hang on, can you say it's assumed to be in Devon? I, I looked it up. It is. Oh, okay, um, okay. It's assumed to be by River Otter, which I assume is the same as Otter River. I don't know why it's like eh. said the other way around. Well, that's just how you say rivers here. Is like mm. the River Seven, the River Thames. I don't know any other rivers. Uh, the River Story. <laughs> so, anyway, so yeah, we, we know roughly where they live, and Harry lives in Surrey, and it's about a three-hour drive, so I don't know what that translates to for flying car speed, but yeah, I mean, either way. For flying cars, I assume it would be as the crow flies. It would be just straight line, so you yeah. can just draw a straight line on a map. And no traffic, and probably can go a bit faster <laughs> than on the road. Yeah. But, so, yeah, nothing too crazy there. Um, so they, they reach, uh, you know, they, they, they get back home, and... I had to look uh, had to look up what tumble down garage meant. Um, <laughs> let me let me find the sentence. Tumble down garage. Where'd it go? Is it just not in the book? What the hell? I I know I read this. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. It's just they. There's the context doesn't even matter. Yeah, it's just you know, they hit the ground. They had landed next to a tumble down garage in a small yard, and I'm like, that those wacky British words. And I look it up. It it's not. It's just <laughs> apparently there's a movie that came out recently that's called Tumble Down. But yeah, it just it just yeah. means dilapidated. I hadn't ever heard of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like I might have mentioned this before, but I really don't get why the borough has its own designated name when it's just a family house. Um, houses do that, yeah. Like, the, the, there, there's a simple answer to the question. Sometimes houses have names. I have lived in at least two houses that had names. They had numbers, like number addresses too, but they also had names. That's odd. Is it I don't just... want to say them because I, like, yeah. I feel like you could probably find the address from that. I'll say one of them. One of them was called Acorns. All right, like, then. there was just a thing on the front of the house that said acorns. <laughs> Did the owners just decide the name? Mm. <laughs> okay, then. Um. Anyway, they have chickens. Chickens are cute. That, that's all I have to say about that. And, um... Then, uh, you know, they're they're going to be heading back inside the house. It's like, <laughs> all right, got to be quiet. We don't want to wake up mom and dad. Uh... We'll just, you know, we'll we'll shove you up into Ron's room, and then we'll come down for breakfast and be like, "Hey, Harry, just turned up in the night." <laughs> like this is the shittiest plan ever. But they don't even get a chance to use this plan because Molly immediately oh. sees them and goes ape shit. Um, yes. Um. So she starts ranting at them, and she's like, "No note beds empty. Had I was had me worried, or well, you know all this yeah. stuff." And um, I I like that the note is like touched on because. I just like the implication that she would have been still mad, but not as mad if they just left a note that's like, by the way, we took the flying car, we're going to go rescue Harry, bye. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like yeah, I, at like, least, okay, I, at I least guess at least she'd know what's going on, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Granted, yeah, the, all the still, all the same problems still would have happened. Where you know right. they could have crashed and died, they could have gotten seen and like lost Arthur's job, like all these things that are brought up. But mm -hmm. at least she would have known. <laughs> I don't know. My like uh, rebellious spirit reading this scene was like, man, they did a good thing though. Leave him alone. And I'm like, nah, she was probably right to be worried. <laughs> yeah, it, logically, I know that, but like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and th I feel I like this is a, <laughs> especially in the movie version, this is a scene that kind of gets parodied, parodied a lot, where um, th they really kind of exaggerate the hell out of it in the movie, where he's, like, you know, she's screaming at them, and then she's just like, of course I'm not mad at you, Harry dear, and just, like, you know, keeps shifting moods extremely drastically, right. and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've seen parodies, like, the one I can think of is, um... It's like, you know, here's Harry's sandwich, and it's like, this has like, what the hell is it? It's like this stupid little cutout thing that you could use for like fucking five-year-olds, where it's like, it cuts the crust off the bread, and it makes it look like a little teddy bear or something, and it's like, here's his sandwich, and then Ron just gets the leftover piece of bread, like the, the crust. Um, yeah. But, 
Yeah, I, I, this is not our first time seeing Molly, but it's our first time seeing her, like, in her element. And yeah. uh, th just the super, you know, mama bear, like, gets, like, very pissed off over these things, but then immediately goes around, like, turns around and starts, you know, making a breakfast anyway. And <laughs> gives Harry, like, fucking nine sausages and three eggs. And it's like... <laughs> to be fair, he had been starving. Yeah. So, yeah, we're you know we're we're getting a little bit of a look into their home life, and then we uh, we see there's a bookshelf, um, and and there's a book on there called Charm Your Own Cheese. <laughs> I, I really don't have anything to say about this one, but it just it stood out to me because of such it had such a stupid name. Um, yes. Like, I I, I'm this curious. Is like cheese manufacturing using magic instead of the normal method, which involves, like, putting in specific conditions and waiting and stuff like that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's like, can you, you know, can you get, like, a little bowl of milk and use a charm on it and turn it into cheese? Like, I mean, you can transfigure <laughs> stuff, so probably. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. But, <laughs> yeah. The whole book, charm your own cheese. Yes. So, we get an early introduction to Lockhart, which I thought was kind of funny, because we see him in the very next chapter, but... You know, yes. I guess a little bit of foreshadowing. There's a lot of that in these uh, early um, books. Is you know, there's only so much you can foreshadow when it's a plot element that's early, but it still happens. So you'll get stuff like something is foreshadowed, and it shows up two chapters later. <laughs> have you have you f seen the he monster and she monster of the forest? Oh my god, there they are! Fight them. Um, <laughs> Good. Uh, there was another phrase I pointed out that I have very little to actually say, but. Uh, if you think you know better than Lockhart, you can go and get on with it, and woe betide you if there's a single gnome in that garden when I come out to inspect it. Yeah. <laughs> I like woe betide you. Me too. H have you heard it in any other context? Like, in any other, like, have I heard it before outside of Harry Potter? Um, yes. I think so. Okay. It, like... I see that, and I think of, like, you know, if I had my druthers. It's just one of those stupid things that, like, you know, nobody has said since the 18th century, but... <laughs> I like druthers. Yes. I learned that word a few years ago. I wish I, I wish I found more opportunities to use it. If I had my druthers, I'd have more opportunities to use it. Yes. So, we get to the denoming scene, which is incredibly fucking pointless, but I think we still have some stuff to <laughs> say about it. About the world building. Yeah. My um, first note is a lasso. It, because it, it's not reason, spelled that way in my version. Yeah, it, there's just an extra O on the end. Like, I've heard British people pronounce it lasso, but I thought that was just a pronunciation thing. I didn't realize it was spelled like that here as well, which bothers me, because, like, no, it's a fucking lasso. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Also, the uh, the gnome has horny little feet. But, yeah, um... What the fuck was up with that? <laughs> so, that mean? like, there's little horns on it. I don't know. Um. So yeah, we basically, you know, they go out into the garden and they have to denome the garden, and <laughs> so, you know, these so these are like debatably sapient creatures. Like they, they can talk and stuff. Language. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're not out here to poison them or stomp on them. Like, we're not going to kill them, so we have to, but we have to get rid of them some other way. And the method of doing this is just throw them away and, like, make them dizzy before you do it so that hopefully they don't wander back to the same hole and they go burrow somewhere else. It's like, <laughs> it's like the shittiest method I've ever heard of. Um, yeah, you'd think they could use magic for it or something. I guess it has to be something um, kids could do, I don't know. Um... So yeah, you know, there's this whole game. It, I had to look up the gnomes also. I'm like, you know, do these ever show up in any, like, interesting capacity? And they, they don't. They're all over the um, fucking early video games. They're, like, one yeah. of the more basic enemies where you'll just find them in dungeons, like, in the school. Like, and by dungeons, I mean, like, because for some reason the first three games, all it, they're sort of like Zelda-likes, but all the dungeons, almost all the dungeons are just a random, like, fucking portal test chamber inside Hogwarts like designed for testing a spell <laughs> and you, some of the rooms will just have a random gnome hole and gnome hole in the wall and you gotta throw the gnome in it's excellent <laughs> but yeah so the gnomes are about a foot tall um they're picking these things up by the legs and swinging them around and throwing them which uh, at first I thought they were doing it shot put 
or not shot put. What do you call it when you like? What's oh, the thing where you like spin around and then like? It's a helmet throw. That's right. I thought they were doing it like that, but I think they're doing it one handed. Um, but there's a line where George grabs five or six at once. And I'm like, <laughs> dear God, dude. <laughs> like, how, like... <laughs> but um, yeah. So they're just kind of throwing these things all over here and. <laughs> You made the note here, but I love the... Like, I'm going to read the actual line. Harry learned quickly not to feel too sorry for the gnomes. <laughs> like... Yeah. Just, he's like, aw, these little guys, and one of them bites him, he's like, okay, fuck him, on again. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it, it, it's just... The whole scene is so weird. It's like, yeah, we've got, like, you know, these little these little people living in the backyard, but they're they're kind of assholes. Fuck them. <laughs> like, don't, don't feel too bad for them. Okay, so yeah, so we got our introduction to Arthur, and he's just, he's great, he's really lively, he feels like a real person. I love how, you know, he's trying to balance between, like, you know, appeasing his wife who is yelling at him for the whole car thing, while also just, be, you know, like, he cannot hide his fucking excitement at, like, oh shit, they actually used the car, did it work? Like, I gotta find out all about it. It's just, yeah. it's great. <laughs> there's a there's a whole bit in here that I actually forgot about completely because I just remember the scene from the movie, um, where um, you know she's yelling at him. Like, he's saying something about like, oh man, the things that our people, like our lot, have taken to enchanting. Now that I realize it, I think that that's an instance where if this was the first book, they would have changed lot to a different yeah, word. Probably, but whatever. Um, yeah, it's like the things that we have taken to enchant it, and she's like, like cars, and he's like, oh, oh, um, but uh, it's like, well, uh, you know, I, I think you'd find he, it'd be well within the law to do that. Even maybe, maybe he would have been better to tell his wife the truth, but uh, there is a loophole, you know. That and she's like, you wrote that law. And it's like I forgot about that whole thing. That was pretty good. It's really good, yeah. But um, I also uh, I genuinely like the part here. Um, where, you know, he comes home and he's talking about, you know, like, he's like, we did nine raids, like, it was a crazy night, and, like, the kids are genuinely interested in his job, it sounds like, you know, they're, he's telling yeah. them about the stuff that's going on, and, you know, they're asking questions, which uh, immediately contradicts them saying that he has the most boring position, but uh, yeah. it's kind of nice to see that, you know, that have an investment in this. Indeed. Um, but yeah, Arthur's pretty great. It's... I, I'll never understand why it is that there's such a generational divide where it seems like the, the younger generation, like Ron, don't really have much of an issue understanding Muggle culture. Like, you know, Ron... Yeah, that's kind of interesting. It's like, of the, th of the three, you know, Harry and Hermione were Muggle-raised... Ron wasn't, and, you know, he occasionally has his moments, like, Cinderella, what's that, a disease? But it's like, you know, <laughs> most of the time, like, he doesn't really seem baffled by common muggle stuff, but Arthur doesn't understand any of it, even though he specifically has an interest in it, like, looks stuff up all the time, and works with it all the time. And yeah. it's just, I don't really get that. It's... <laughs> <laughs> I, like, there's really no answer here. I think it's just... It's a minor plot hole, but... Yeah. I guess. Maybe it's just there's so much to muggle culture that he, he can't, you know, truly grasp all of it. Plus, this is, like, pre-good internet, and also, muggle, you know, wizards don't really use it. Yeah. They have something even better, which we'll find out about later. Oh, um, do we? No, but that was... Oh, right. Okay. Like, there was a thing Rowling said in an interview, and no one knows what she was talking about. That's right. <laughs> um, I was just memeing. Yeah, it's like, you know, the example is, uh, what is the function of a rubber duck? And it's like, I mean, well, <laughs> what is... in the movie, right? Yeah, I, d I don't think he asked it in the book. Um, I'd have to check. But, yeah, it's like, you know, what is the function of it? I don't know, it's just... It, it's there. He, he's probably just, like, it has to do something. It's like, no, nah, it doesn't. <laughs> Um, yes. So we get an early mention of Mundungus, um, which Mundungus Fletcher. Yeah, I thought it was kind of weird. Like, it's I, I wasn't completely caught off guard by it because I. Th this is a really stupid thing, but uh, when Order of the Phoenix came out, you know, I read that book or whatever, and that was the first time where 
Monungus actually had like any kind of presence. But um Yeah. <clears throat> I forget what brought this up, but at some point, like after that book, I was talking with Harrison and he's he mentioned that like, you know, Mundungus had been mentioned like five times before, and I'm like, What do you mean? He's like, Yeah, he's like the main character. He gets brought up so much. I'm like <laughs> the funny Like what do you and the, I'm like I, I'm just like okay obviously you're exaggerating but like what yeah. and I check and he gets brought up here and I, he gets brought up again like at the very end of Goblet of Fire when they're like we got to get the old gang back together um I, I think that might have been it I'll have to keep an eye out okay. <laughs> um yeah um and then but uh, we do get an actual instance of a named one-off character here of uh Mort Lake which is the uh it's somebody who just has enchanted ferrets. Um, let's Good. let me see. What was the context here? <sighs> yeah, all I got were a few shrinking door keys and a biting kettle. There was some pretty nasty stuff that wasn't my department, though. Mortlake was taken <laughs> away for questioning about some extremely odd ferrets, but that's <laughs> a different department. So, like, we don't find out what's up with the ferrets, and we don't know who Mortlake is, but he gets named, so he he gets special the, attention here. The fact that he's just men he's mentioned by name indicates to me, like, either this is a well-known guy, or... Like, it's weird. Like, I don't know. Is it, is it just that every wizard fucking knows each other because they're such a small and yeah. I mean, it could it could have been somebody that was, like, you know, a repeat issue that he keeps running into uh, so the maybe, family knows yeah. about him. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and then to skip ahead just slightly, uh, when they go to Ron's bedroom, there is a comic book. There's a stack of comics that are all, like, the same series of, uh, yeah. Martin Miggs the Mad Muggle, which <laughs> sounds like possibly the shittiest comic ever, and uh, They actually made a prop version of it for, for like, one of the movies. Yeah, the, apparently it shows up in the background at some point in the Prisoner of Azkaban movie, and I, I, I looked this thing up, and, like, I guess the, the comic was also in one of the games, and, like... I don't know. Okay. It it never sh like in the actual main book series it never gets mentioned again, but it's apparently in some of the like expanded media. But yeah, the the, the prop comic they made is terrible. <laughs> so I, I like skimmed it. Yeah, like I literally, I literally like glanced over it and got bored. <laughs> yeah, it's like I th I don't even know like it's basically newspaper comic quality. Like the joke right. is just there is a Frenchman. <laughs> like that, that as far as I can tell, that's it. That was a Frenchman once. <laughs> yes. Um, um But yeah, the only other things that really I think are worth addressing in this chapter are Ron's violently orange room, which <laughs> I have to imagine is gotta be a fucking eyesore and like, you know, trying to sleep with this bright color it everywhere is <laughs> terrible. How would it make but, you fun um, to sleep? That doesn't make any sense. I don't know, it just hurts your eyes. Um, but, uh, the other thing is, uh, Harry's head, uh, almost touches the quote-unquote sloped ceiling in Ron's room when he enters it, which, I, I, I'm a little confused by that, as it's sloped even at the door, <laughs> but, um, also it's just, you know, they're, they're 12, and Ron, like, not only do they both, you know, obviously get taller as they get older, but Ron is also described as being, like, super tall. So, like, I wonder if this right. room magically gets bigger over time, or if he, like, <laughs> changes to a different room, or if he's just stuck in this tiny, cramped room the entire time. God. Um, I once had a tiny, cramped room. I think I mentioned it probably in the context of Harry's shitty room, but I once had a room where I had a single bed that took up, like, 50% of the floor space. Yep, that was my, uh... That, that was the case with my fucking pantry, too. Mm. But, uh... Yeah, we we end that chapter then with, you know, the, uh... The charming little moment. You know, this is the part where... Like, you know, it does the... It has to do, like, a zoom in on Harry's face as he looks to the camera and says something to make the audience go awe. Or it's just, Ron's like, oh, the, the house is a bit small, but, you know, it's it got all these issues. And he's just like, this is the best house I've ever been in. But, um, <laughs> Ron turns pink. Yes. So, so that's chapter three. Yep. Chapter four, where uh, the first thing that I found notable was... Uh, 
Errol's extreme <laughs> shittiness. I fucking love Errol. <laughs> yeah, He's Errol so the cool. Owl. Um, like, you know, they're having breakfast, and Percy comes in, and he sits down and, like, immediately jumps back up, and Harry's like, he pulled out a molten gray feather duster. Or at least that's what he thought it was, until it started breathing. It was actually an owl. It's like, oh god, like, this thing is fucking dead. Like... <laughs> Yeah, I just I like you know Errol had been set up in the previous chapter as being like you know old and unreliable and it's just I love this fucking half dead bird that mm -hmm. just, yeah not much else to say about it um um so then uh they get a letter from Hermione and in my version there's a typo where she says let me know what's been happening with three P's. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, I thought that was funny. I like, I like the implication that it wasn't a typo on Rowling's part, because it's being, this is actually supposed to be Hermione's words, so I'm, I like the implication that Hermione made a typo with a quill and ink. Yes. Uh, Hermione's letter has, uh, surprisingly, you know, a couple things to actually point out about it, even though it's, like, only two sentences, practically. Um, the whole thing is, like, run-on sentences, which I feel like early Hermione is very excitable. Uh, <laughs> she kind of, like, mellows out over time, but, like, especially in the first book, you know, when she's answering questions to the teacher, she, like, you know... Oh, like, my parents were ever so pleased, of course. Yes. As, as was I, was ever so pleased. <laughs> yeah, like, that kind of crap. She's just like, I hope everything went all right, and that Harry is okay, and that you didn't do anything illegal to get him out, Ron, because that would get Harry into trouble, too. <laughs> and just... <laughs> I, I, so I kind of like that. It, it fits her character quite well. And then, except, I, except also she's maintaining that energy while writing a letter, which is more time consuming than speaking. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> and I love this line here. I'm very busy with schoolwork, of course. How can she be? Said Ron in horror. <laughs> We're on vacation. <laughs> just, because it says that they're... <laughs> Like, Ron's reading the letter out loud, and he just, he reads that, he's like, oh my god, what? <laughs> and there's two aspects to this, because one, we learned in the chapter one that apparently they do have summer homework, so that either means that, like, she's working way too hard on it, or that mm -hmm. Ron forgot about it completely, either way, <laughs> kind of works, but also just... I like to imagine that they didn't have any homework, and yet she's still somehow busy with schoolwork anyway, and that Ron <laughs> is completely in the right for being horrified by this. That'd be funny, yeah. Like, I don't know why. It's just, it's so, it's so in character. Like, oh god, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, so, so they go outside to play some Quidditch. And yeah, and it. they go out to uh, a haddock. Or is that the word? Oh, a paddock. Uh, yeah, I think a haddock is paddock, a fish. Yeah. Um, a haddock is a fish, yes. Yeah, so they go to a, a paddock, which I didn't know what that was, and it's like a horse pen. Um, yeah. I don't think they have horses, though. And they're playing, like, practice Quidditch, and they can't use real Quidditch balls because, like, you know, those could have escaped and flown away to the village, but it's like the Quaffle doesn't do that, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, so they just threw apples at each other, basically. I imagine that it eventually turned into, you know, just hitting each other with them and not even playing the game. And then they played that um, stupid Flash game about, like, shooting the apple off a person's head, which, this is a complete fucking tangent, I'm not gonna go on it fully, but, like, you ever just realize something is, like, a thing that's not specifically from something? Like, because I found a page about, like, you know, shooting an apple off of someone's head on Wikipedia, and it's just, like, no one knows where this idea came from. It's not, like, from a specific... I thought it was... Thing. I thought it was William Tell. I don't know who or what that it is. But... I, think, I think it predates it. Hmm. All right, then. <laughs> anyway, completely, completely pointless. I mean, that just video. makes me think of uh, the frickin' Noxus Corner Clayman video of the guy shooting a bunch of tomatoes off of his friend. And it's like, <laughs> hold on, I have to do this. It's like... You don't have to. He's like, no, no, hold on. There's something I have to do. And then he shoots all the tomatoes, and, mm -hmm. you know, everything's fine. He's like, how do you like them apples? You get it? Because they're tomatoes. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. But <laughs> Sorry for derailing us a bit, though. Um... No, this is fine. Uh, this was an instance of a sassy narrator, which is not going to be yes. a counter, but it, it almost kind of deserves <laughs> to be one. It's a counter in you guys' hearts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
they're you know they're passing around Harry's Nimbus 2000 because it's the best broom they have, and it says Ron's old shooting star was often outstripped by passing butterflies. God. <laughs> like, you're throwing so much shade at this broomstick. It's it's great. Um. <laughs> Uh, so th here's this other whole thing where, like, I don't yeah. really want to get into this, but it's... I kind of don't either. People have mentioned it before, like, there's this whole thing where, like, Harry feels guilty because the, the Weasleys are poor and he has all this money, and I've seen numerous people online actually bitching about this to where, like, it's so irresponsible of Harry and so selfish that he doesn't share his money with them. And people will, like... They, they've actually cited things from the books where it's, like... There there have been instances where Harry offers, and Molly's just like, oh, no, 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 don't, don't worry about it. Like, we'll manage. And there's another time where it's, like, he knows that the Weasleys are, like, you know, they would be... They would be too prideful to accept it. I don't think prideful is the term, but, like... It would be insulting for them to have to accept money from a child, basically. And he, and then people are like, well, like, he's only assuming that. He doesn't actually try to. It's like, shut up, damn. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like if it was ever an issue, then, you know, Harry is very generous and he would not have minded giving up some of his money. It just mm. never comes up. Like, yeah. There's, like, a whole thing I read in a post about how, like, um, there's a sort of unspoken culture between, like, working class and poorer people where, <clears throat> you know, they'll often pay for each other for things, um, you know, as and when they have a little bit extra that they, you know, if somebody else has a little bit less, it's kind of like a communal thing. And that this is, you know, sometimes disrupted when it comes to friend groups that have people of, you know, varying classes in there. So, you know, I've heard of situations where, like, there's a group of friends and one of them is like, you know, hey, I have these, like, super expensive tickets to this, like, big, you know, su like, stupid expensive event or whatever. Like, do you want to come with? And then, you know, usually the poor person will, you know, decline. And this is basically because there's an unspoken feeling of, like, I would need to reciprocate this and I'm never going to be able to pay you back for this. So it would create awkwardness in our relationship. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Like, you know, even if it's, like, I've actually, I've seen that firsthand. Even if it's like, you know, there's no stipulations here, I'm going to buy this for you, and you never have to pay me back, you know, there's still a feeling of, you know, I don't want to have to accept your handout, I'll feel guilty, like, it's right. fine. I feel like yeah. that applies in this situation. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, I, think, I think that's what the Weasleys are feeling like, is that, like, well, even if you're just helping us ge generously we would feel like we need to pay you back eventually. And I don't know if we ever could. So yeah. there might be that one of that. And uh, <clears throat> I guess that actually ties in well to the next thing I pointed out here of just, it, it it's a blink and you miss it sentence of uh, <laughs> before they go to Diagon Alley, they have half a dozen bacon sandwiches each, which just Jesus Christ. That stood out to me. I don't think it's um, blink and you miss it. Yeah. They had fucking six, <laughs> six sandwiches each. Um, and so I've seen a lot of people wonder, you know, first of all, why are the Weasleys so goddamn poor? And I think the answer is just because there's a lot of them. Like, you know, Arthur has a ministry job. It probably pays decently, but, you know, there's a lot of people there. Um, mm -hmm. They might also be bad with money. I don't know. Like, again, getting ahead of getting ahead of things, like, you know, in the third book, they use most of their money on the Egyptification, but... Eh, whatever. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, um. Either way, like, so there, there's that whole aspect that it's like, you know, how, how do they have all this food? Because every time you see, um, you know, Harry's there and Molly food, is, Molly's always making like a shit ton of food for them. And this is kind of touched upon in the seventh book where okay. when they're, when they're out, you know, in their fucking camping adventure for half the book, um, Ron is grumbling because he, either, you know, they barely have any food, and he's like, you know, my mom could make great, like, perfectly great food out of nothing. And Hermione's like, no, she can't. That's impossible. Like, you can't create food from nothing. And they specifically say that if you have food already, you can like duplicate it, 
but you can't like turn you can't transfigure something into something edible so isn't wait how can you duplicate what (laughs) surely that's still making something out of nothing unless well it's i i guess the idea is you know if you have literally nothing you can't just wave your wand and you know create a bacon sandwich but if you have one you can make it into like 50 so that, that doesn't make any sense to me but all right i don't know it, it's a little weird but i guess that's how the magic works like i'm applying um, like full metal alchemist equivalent exchange laws here and i'm like yeah the whole the whole issue with creating something out of nothing is that you're not putting anything into the equation even if you have a little bit you shouldn't be able to make more because that's the same thing as make like turning one into 50 is the same as turning zero into 49 to me yeah i mean i agree <laughs> with you but i guess that's just how it is is fair enough if you have i guess duplication is just a thing and so that kind of explains mm. it because they have the chickens you know they're laying eggs so you know get one egg from them and then suddenly you know you can make mm. as many eggs as you want with that until it goes bad so i guess that kind of helps with some of it um yeah i forget what point i was even trying to make here but it's all <laughs> it was all vaguely related um um so they're about to uh, leave the house, and Arthur's still bugging Harry with questions about the real world because Harry mentions like, "Oh, I've never taken, you know, I've never like taken this flu network thingy," and Arthur's like, "Really? How'd you get to Diagon Alley?" He's like, "Oh, I took the underground." He's like, "Oh, I have so many questions about the underground. Why, were, were there escapators?" And I swear, I was about to look up what an escapator was before I realized he just meant escalator. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> um. And speaking of the flu network, uh, it's spelled F L O O, and it's named after a different thing called flu. Uh, which, uh, a flu is like sort of an exhaust duct for a chimney. It's spelled F L E U E. I did not know this as a kid, and I didn't get the name. I didn't know why it was called the flu network. Yeah, I had no idea either. It just the, the best association I could get was the sound is sort of similar to like blowing your nose, and I thought it was like because you know the powder makes you like cough and sneeze and stuff. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> So yeah, the flu network sucks ass. Um, you wanna yeah. you wanna cover this one? Yeah, I, I, have, I have another note here about it, which is just it seems really inconvenient, especially when apparition is a thing. Like, you know, obviously, apparition has its whole its, its whole like set of issues. Like, there's splicing, you know, in the worst splinching. Case, but, oh, splinching! I thought it was called splicing for some reason. <clears throat> there's splints it, splinching. Um, it's like a thing that only older wizards can. Or, yeah, it's you know, it's basically can. you have to get a driver's license for it right like so you know fair enough in that sense but then they add side long apparition later and then that kind of uh... yeah. <laughs> and then even then well no I, I guess i guess it probably is the second best thing but it's still really inconvenient just because like you know as we see here you have to fucking be careful not to fucking end up in the wrong exit and yeah i'm not sure how you control this because the way they describe it is you know you you throw the powder in Actually, I have a question even before that. Like, you know, maybe I'm just stupid because, or or like maybe I'm used to fireplaces or that are different than the ones that we're talking about here. But like, you know, they're standing in this fireplace, not in front of it. Like, how right. tall is like? Usually, I, I imagine these is like you know, there's like a little archway that's like a couple feet tall, and right, then right. you know, the chimney straight above that. That's a good like, question. I'm not I sure what they're standing in. I assume wizard fireplaces are just built bigger. I don't know. Maybe, um, but yeah. So you, you throw the thing, you throw the powder in. Who knows where this powder comes from? Whatever. You throw that in. You you know you you shout where you're going. You go in, and then it's like you enter fucking hell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, you, you're you're swirling in this green vortex, and like apparently you like your elbows are banging into stuff, and. The, the way they describe this is really weird because he's like they're saying you know you got to close your eyes because like the soot's gonna get in your eyes um but also like you know you got to make sure you get out at the right exits like don't leave until you see fred and george on the other side it's like what and how do you see anything yeah it's like i guess you're seeing all the fireplaces that you're moving past but like you know spinning around with flames and just general uncomfortableness everywhere and it's like why do you shout the name of the thing does that like does that direct <laughs> you to where you're going because there's apparently it's not foolproof system. like yeah there's gonna be some kind of central system that like interprets this yeah i think it's like 
you you say the name of the thing and then it like tries to put you near it but you still have to get off at the right exit somehow like i don't yeah. know it's weird <laughs> like what happens if you don't do anything do you just end up in a loop near the thing or do you just go way the fuck far out like <sighs> i don't know um Shit, does this count as whimsy? I would actually say this probably does. Maybe, like, it's like, hypothetically, if this is the best they can do for, like, non-apparative, like, quick transportation, then then it's not yeah, whimsy. Yeah, because you've, got, you've got apparition, you've got, which is, you know, it, it's the best way to get around, but it it's kind of difficult to do, and it can go wrong. This just sucks ass. Then you have port keys, which are they're similar to this, but they don't have the risk of dumping you off at the wrong place. And they're also, limited, and you have to like specifically set them yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, you have to set up like you know, I'm gonna. This is gonna go to this location, and I think they're also ministry regulated. Like you can't set one up without getting permission for it. Oh, I see. And then, other than that, there's just you know broomsticks, fine which are brooms. fine, but. And random flying They're, creatures like hippogriffs and festivals. Yeah. So, I guess of the options, this one's not so bad, but it. God, does it, it have a lot bad. of drawbacks. <laughs> <laughs> like. Uh, so, yeah, you had a note here. Oh, oh yeah, I love this part. Um, you know, everyone's shouting instructions at Harry. It's like, okay, you gotta say the name clearly, you gotta tuck your elbows in, close your eyes, keep. Well, Close your eyes, but also keep your eyes open for Fred and George. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Molly is worried, like, oh, Harry's never done it before. What if he gets lost? The Dursleys are going to be, like, they'll be, like, so upset. And he's just like, oh, the Dursleys won't mind. They'll just think it would be funny. And she's like, oh, okay. I, I, like, assume, I assume the Dursley thing was just an afterthought, and then Harry gave a quip, and Molly didn't know what to say to it. <laughs> well, I know. It wasn't even that. It's just, he, he says, like, they won't mind, and she's just like, oh, well, all right, then. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I don't remember that. Fair. Um, the diagonally thing. Yeah, this I've never understood this. So, like, in the movie, the way it goes is they explain, you know, speak clearly. Blah blah. He gets in, he starts choking on the powder, and he doesn't say diagon alley like they say in the movies normally. He goes diagonally. <laughs> yeah. And I always interpreted that as like oh no, he accidentally said diagonally, and so the network is now just going to send him in a random diagonal direction <laughs> instead of to Diagon Alley. But then he ends up near it anyway. So did it or did it not interpret... Um... I think it was like... Th this is the equivalent of, you know, you type something into Google but spell it wrong, and it's like, <laughs> did you mean this? And so it, like, it directs you to the right thing anyway, but because he's fucked up, it still is, like, one-off. I don't know. Yeah, and it, the movie like, is, like... I don't know like... if this is the issue or not, because then it's, it's also implied the issue might just be, like, he got out too early or too late. And then I, I think it's actually confirmed later that, like that he just fell out late so i don't know it's it's confusing yeah it, and, and it's also movie, totally different be like <laughs> Di diagon alley <laughs> but no he specifically says like diagonally <laughs> like it that's how he does it in the story. movie in the book yeah I he know, just I is know. coughing on the ash but yeah um either way i guess this is mostly just a movie problem but yeah, yeah pretty much <clears throat> um <laughs> I like your reference here. Yeah, Harry Harry emerges from the, the flu network, and he's pitch black and covered in soot. Um, you'll know what it means if you know what it means. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> Harry's in uh, Borgen and Burks, and there's, you know, this is our first instance in this book, but uh, probably the 11th instance overall, because they do this all the goddamn time, of Harry just kind of, like, you know sneaking around and listening to a conversation and getting like important yep. information um yeah rolling loves this plot device <laughs> but uh th it's it's really weird though because there's a surprising amount of foreshadowing here um yeah there is harry That's is hiding inside the vanishing cabinet and it's if you if you pay attention to the text he never closes the door all the way. He always leaves it a little bit open so he can see, like, what the Malfoys are doing. But if he did, it, he would have ended up in the fucking room of requirement in Hogwarts. <laughs> or a toilet. Because, oh, yeah, because it was broken, I forgot. Yeah, like, yeah, if he, if he had closed the door all the way, like, something fucky would have happened. Like, I don't know <laughs> where he would have ended up, but it probably wouldn't have been good. Um, He might have also died, and then Draco would start crying. 
<clears throat> oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, we also have the, uh, you, you pointed out the necklace, um, which mm -hmm. that comes up a little bit later. Um, I didn't even realize that Malfoy mentioned this, like, by name later, but, like, it, it, as he's in the shop looking at the stuff on the shelves before hiding in the cabinet, Harry notices, like, a hand, and, yeah, this is yeah. the hand of glory that Malfoy ev eventually ends up with that, like, it kind of comes in... What this does. <clears throat> they actually say in this chapter, it like, it provides light to you, but nobody else, so it's used when, for, like... When is this used? It's used in Half Blood Prince, I think, where like it, it was either that or I, I don't remember. There's there's something where like they set off like a bunch of uh instant darkness powder and then Malfoy uses the hand to get through it anyway, like when he's leading oh, the Death Eaters through the castle. See, I guess it was Half Blood Prince. Um <clears throat> it's just kind of a thing he has. But right. uh um, so, yeah, the, the, it's also mentioned, like, there's human bones around. How does Harry know the bones are human, exactly? I don't think I'd be able to tell. <laughs> I just yeah. feel like those are the bones. I also like the, uh, the hangman's noose. Like, why the hell is that there? But the, this entire shop is just random dark shit. Like, some of yeah. it is cursed, some of it is... I don't know is... how shit this is allowed in the first place, to be honest. I think <clears> I don't <throat> know about that, actually, but... Right, um... So, like, I love the shop, though, because, you know, you've got some stuff where it's like, you know, this this necklace has killed 19 people so far. Don't touch it. You will die. And then you have, you know, the hand that does this specific thing. And then you just have, like, here's some bones, here's a noose, because, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, that's that's evil. Like, <laughs> By the way, I want to ask, do we ever find out who Burke is? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, I'll have to keep that in mind for later. I don't really want to search it right now. Yeah, fair. Um, um, so yeah, Harry's hiding in the cabinet, and then Malfoy and Malfoy come in, and by that I mean Draco Malfoy and his dad Lucius. Yeah. And as per usual, Draco will not shut the fuck up about Harry. It's really quite funny. Um, yeah, he's he just like... He, <laughs> the, the, the way is so good, because he's just like... Like, Lucius is like, I told you I'd get you a gift. Or, or he's like, can I get something from the shop? He's like, I told you I'd get you a broom. He's like, I can't, why can I get, like, a broom won't help. I can't get on the team. Only Potter can get on the team. He's so perfect. And it's like, yes, thank you. You've told me this 12 times. Shut up. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it's confirmation that Malfoy literally, does not shut the fuck up about Harry. Literally the first conversation Harry hears Malfoy like, partaking in is him bitching about Harry. It's so good. Um, who the fuck knows what Ponce Ney are? Oh, is that how you pronounce that? Yeah, I looked it up. It's French. It's like Ponce Ney. Yeah, it's it's spelled Pince Nez. <laughs> yes. um, Borgen like puts these on or something, and I'm like, okay, what the fuck are these? And it's like a specific. They're just of glasses. glasses without. They're just glasses without like the stems that sit on your ears. It's just the the lenses with like the frame and the nose bridge, and then it's like usually connected to a chain or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a very very confusing <clears throat> sentence here. Yeah. Um. So let, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and just read all of this out. Um. Yeah. So as as Lucius is talking to Borgen, he's like, I have a few uh, items at home that might embarrass me if the Ministry were to call. He's like, the Ministry wouldn't presume to trouble you, sure, surely. He's like, I haven't been visited yet. The name Malfoy still you commands a certain... Me, yes. The name Malfoy still commands a certain respect. Yet the Ministry grows ever more meddlesome. There are rumors about a new Muggle Protection Act. No doubt that flea-bitten, muggle-loving fool Arthur Weasley is behind it. It cuts away to, hangry, to Harry being angry. It cuts back. As you see, certain of these poisons might make it appear... I understand, sir, of course, said Mr. Morgan. Let me yeah. see. Hang on. Um, Certain <laughs> of these poisons might make it appear. I I think I know what they're trying to say, and I don't know how I would phrase it. Is he just saying, you know, out of these poisons, certain ones, certain certain ones here had the ability to make it appear that something, something. Like, like it's just if it's horribly... So here's the thing, like, it... If we ignore the word poison, let's just say that he uses the word, like, you know, item. 
Like certain some certain of these items might make it appear, you know, he's implying like, oh, because I have these, some of these might make it look like I'm a dark wizard. So like that might be what he's saying, but why does he say poisons? Like, I don't know. It's just a weird sentence. I assume they're just talking about some poisons. I'm just bothered by the weird grammar on here. If any, I tried to look this up. By the way, I quote searched I did certain too. of these poisons and found nothing. So. I didn't look very far. I found I a I found an article about you know dark just, artifact. Yes, yeah, I that saw just that it quotes this exact line, and it's like okay, you didn't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um. So yeah, yeah, the opal necklace gets mentioned. We talked about that. That comes up in Half Blood Prince. It, it appears here. Yeah. Um. There's also a bit that uh, I, this was written very like very theatrically like this is the type of thing where you know at this point there was no <laughs> no idea that these books were going to be made into movies but like reading the sentence you can picture it exactly where like draco is a he's like hmm what's this cabinet reaches hand out <laughs> dramatically approaches draco we're leaving okay and then he turns away like a second before opening <laughs> it and seeing harry it's like it's it's yeah. so dramatic um, I, I I do have to love the stupid stealth sections in these books because like that became a recurring feature of the of the games is they always insert these stealth sections, and especially I, in the console versions. I also kind of had to question, you know, what would happen if Harry was caught? It's just like yeah, Potter, what are you doing here? He's like, got lost. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, like what are they gonna do? Like, are they like, gonna? It wouldn't have been immediate consequences. I suppose it would have just been. Like, you know, maybe he gets told off later, rumors start to spread. I mean, you know, people start to, like, question his morality later in this book anyway, uh, so it probably wouldn't Yeah, the fact that he's in a dark shop is, is, I guess, a bad look. But, you know, if it was just an instance of, like, he's in here and listening to Malfoy's conversation, it's like... Yeah. Uh, like, what are they gonna this, do? This, this doesn't matter for, like, the canon, obviously, but in the game, I know that if you get caught by Mr. Borgen, I'm pretty sure he's just, like ah, what are you doing here? And then it's like, oh no. You know, and it goes back to, you, to like the last checkpoint. And it's like... What are you doing here? Well, I don't know what he says, but you know, like, it's it's just, it's just, oh no, you failed to escape. And it's like, okay, why is this a game over though? Like, why why do I have to go back to my checkpoint? Mario gets <laughs> cardiac arrest because he didn't break 12 <laughs> crates in the allowed time limit. Oh my fucking god. But, oh. yes. <sighs> so... Anyway, yeah, we have this whole scene with them. Um, as soon as Lucius leaves, uh, Borgen is described he's earlier. He's described Borgen. earlier as being like he has oily hair and a voice to match, which immediately ties into the like you know everybody evil is ugly or whatever. But um, um, yeah, it's like as soon as I, this is a stupid comparison, but the way that he's described as like buttering up Lucius and just like oh yes of course uh, like it, it, it makes me think of the the fucking lizard guy from um Spanish Fry which is a Futurama episode the uh -huh. one who's like how may I pervert you <laughs> like <laughs> the one who's selling human horn like <laughs> oh I don't remember that he's like look I'm a I'm a monster in a sex shop I don't care what you think but um Anyway, yeah, as soon as Lucius leaves, he's just like, fucking jackass. <laughs> like, like, nobody, <laughs> nobody likes Lucius. Like, even other, like, even other shady people selling cursed items are like, man, fuck that guy. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did enjoy this part. I always um, like stuff like that. It, I, it, it, it gives me a similar vibe to when, like, villains team up with heroes, is just villains getting, like, like hating on other villains and yeah. conflicting with them. Um, like, the dude's an asshole. Like, we, we've barely seen anything of him, but he doesn't do anything. He's just, he has, like, he's from a rich family, and he just kind of uses his, like, his wealth and the fact that, like, he has, yeah, he throws his money around and the fact, like, oh, the Malfoys are a respected family. So he just kind of influences shit. But he doesn't <laughs> yeah. do anything. Like. <laughs> God. Oh. Um, I, and I love your sentence here. <laughs> this entire street sells illegal shit and also pesticide. 
Yeah, because because Harry finally sneaks out of the shop and he bumps into a couple of spooky witches. That yeah, like, one of <laughs> yeah, one of which I point out. You know, he he he's bumbling out of the shop and people are staring. And there's like this this witch that has like a tray full of severed fingers, and she's described as having moldy teeth. And so I'm just... what? I thought it was fingernails. Um. I'll, I'll look. But yeah, I just... This witch walks up to him. <laughs> and, like, this place is just so randomly dark for no reason. Like, why does this place exist? Whole human fingernails. Oh, okay. And then she grinned showing... Uh, she, she leered at him showing mossy teeth. Why does she have moss growing on her teeth? <laughs> um, she's a witch you know there's witches which are just you know women witches. capable of doing magic and then there's witches yeah. that you know make a noise in the kitchen and then stand there for an hour <laughs> <laughs> this is really random but I assume there has to be a Minecraft resource pack that replaces the witch sound effects with Louis C.K.'s like impression <laughs> I would hope so like <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that's as like as well known and loved of a reference, like for people other than me, mm. <laughs> I just I love okay, that. Well, if I, if I ever but... make one for whatever reason, then I gotta include that. Yes. Um. So. Anyway, yeah, so yeah, he bumps into Hagrid, and you know, Hagrid basically escorts him out of this random ass dark. <laughs> like it's just Why you you, you, you have you have Diagon Alley, which you know as we've seen in the first movie is like oh my god everything's so great and magical like isn't this amazing and then you just have this this other alley coming out of it where it's just like you know this it's is the where the villains go like <laughs> you know this this is where you go to get your back alley abortions and <laughs> cursed necklaces like right I don't understand like, why this place is here like like why is it allowed. Yeah, there was something I was going to say, shit. Um, fuck. I can't remember that. I mean, obviously it sells other stuff too, because Hagrid gets like his pesticide here, hence my snarky note. But like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's describing other shops here. It just says, like, you know, he sees a display of shrunken heads, a large cage with giant black spiders. Oh, um, I remember what it reminds me of. You know, like... I don't know if this is. I, I'm, I'm sure. I think I've heard other people say this too. But you know, when you're a kid and you hear about the black market and you just imagine. Oh God! Like yeah, this is literally the black market. <laughs> yeah, whereas obviously it just refers to like illicit deals of all kinds, like collectively. But you know, as you're as a kid, you think of it as like a physical place where you you go here to do your your shady dealings. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but either way, yeah, Hagrid escorts him out of here. Thankfully, it's not very far. Um, he says he's looking for uh, flesh-eating slug repellent, and I still yes. want to know if the repellent is flesh-eating or if the slugs are, because the slugs Top are ruining the school. Can't answer. Hmm? Top ten mystery scientists can't answer. Yeah, because the slugs are ruining the school cabbages, so they don't only eat flesh; they at least also eat cabbages. So, mm -hmm. like, maybe you know. It's just, these are regular slugs, and this is repellent that just fucking dissolves them. Like, <laughs> I don't know. This has got to be top of the list for questions to ask rolling if no one else has. Yes. I, this is like a thing that gets brought up a lot, isn't it? The flesh-eating slug repellent thing? I, th I think. <clears throat> um, so yeah, you know, he gets them out, they run into Hermione and the, and the Weasleys, and he, uh, they're like, where were you, Diagon? Or I was in Nocturne Alley, and they're like, oh man, that's awesome, we've never been allowed to go here. And Hagrid's like, and rightfully so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have to make that not a thing, it's gonna piss you off so much. I know. No, he says, like, what was his, like, ready well hope not, or something, but... Yeah. Um... So yeah, I have a snarky comment here as well. Uh, like son, like father, movie Hermione steals moments from them both. So I knew that in the movie, Hermione fixed Harry's glasses. I wasn't sure who did it in the book. It's fucking Arthur. <laughs> so she steals moments not only from Ron, but she even steals an Arthur moment. <laughs> God. Um, okay. Yeah, actually... Yeah, because there's the whole Oculus Reparo... It's like, yeah. no, it's just Reparo. Like, there is no spell specifically for glasses. What the fuck are you talking about? Also, you're underage <laughs> doing magic outside of school. Oh, like, yeah. Like, what? I guess because, you know, it's in no, Diagon Alley and no one's gonna s know it, but it's still technically against the law. Yeah, I guess that's <laughs> a problem. 
Um, um. And then I, and then it's mentioned that Hermione's parents are there, and they're like trying to exchange their money and stuff. And Arthur gets all excited. He's like, "Oh, and also about, my, about Muggle money." Like I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was that Muggles can go to Diagon Alley and they can exchange money. Because I guess I didn't think about it. Because like I mean, yeah, how else are the fucking you know Muggleborns going to get their stuff? But... Yeah, it is kind of weird. <laughs> like, uh, so here's the thing. I'm pretty sure this is the only time we ever actually see Hermione's parents. Um, and I checked, they don't have names. They have <laughs> fake names that Hermione gives them when she wipes their memories, but they don't have original names. Um, like, they're, like, they're not given them in the books, you mean? Yeah. Um, Were mine extended media? No, they were never named. Wow. Um, okay. They, ne they never speak. Like, we, they're, they're th seen throughout this chapter, just kind of, like, standing in the background being, like, you know curious slash horrified by the things going on I, I think like you know they're in the bank and are like creeped out by the goblins or whatever but they never say a single word so technically they are actually below the named one-off characters <laughs> because they don't have names like uh, and um this is like some one is not a prime number because one because prime numbers have to have two factors themselves and one and one only has itself <laughs> as a factor, so it's not a prime number. Yeah. This, this is some one is not um, a prime number shit. Um, but yeah, I, I had to look them up, because I'm like, you know, they, they gotta have something, right? And they really don't. We know that <laughs> they're, they're dentists. dentists. <laughs> they go on a trip to France at some point, and like, go skiing. Like... They used to go camping in the Forest of Dean, right? Yeah. Um, like, so apparently, like, Ro uh, Rowling did this on purpose, because she just kind of wanted to emphasize that you know, some families are more interesting than others, I guess. I don't know. Like, they're just normal people. They don't matter. Um, Still a bit weird. But apparently in uh, in an early draft of the series, uh, they were supposed to live very close to Harry as a baby, and, like, when James and Lily were killed, uh, Hermione's dad was actually going to find him and, like, row him across a river to, like, some other place. I, I don't fucking know. I don't know how early this was. Weird. Um I don't, I don't know how that would have played out, but fair enough. Yeah. Um so that that's them. They they show up and that's it. Yeah. Um but yeah, we go to Gringotts and you know, we're checking out the vaults and the Weasleys are like comically poor. They go to their vault and there's a small pile of sickles and one galleon. Basically they have like yeah. maybe twenty, thirty bucks in here, like if that. Like, why? it's like maybe they had other money with them, and they were just going to see what they could scrounge out of the bank in case it wasn't enough. So maybe yeah. they do have a bit more. Like, like, why? Why even have that in the bank? You would think like, whoever took, you know, the rest, like most of that out of there, would have, you know, just taken the the rest basically. <laughs> yeah, and they they bring up a few times throughout the chapter, like um. Like, oh no, like, all these Lockhart books are on the, like, required list, and they're, like, what is it, like, eight books from him, and they're, like, all expensive, and they have to buy five sets, and it's, like, how are we gonna do it? And Molly's just, like, we'll, we'll manage. It's, like, okay, but, like, actually, how, though? You don't <laughs> have the money for this. You just don't. <laughs> like. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, to, like, to be honest, growing up, you know, not well off, I, I would say we were... I don't know if I'd say poor, but I'm, I, I would say poor. Maybe not now, necessarily. We're a little better. Still not, you know. That's a whole other tangent, is, like, any time, you know, I, I perceived us as poor, and I would call us that sometimes, and my family would always get mortified, like, don't say that, it's so embarrassing. And like, my family was the same way. true. Um, <laughs> but, I got yelled at at a store once for, like, not wanting to buy candy, because I'm like, I don't know if I can, like, it's like, I don't, I don't, we, I know we're like you know we don't have a lot of money this month, and it's just like don't say that people don't like that's embarrassing. Can't even buy a candy bar, like I'm like oh my god, god. like <laughs> just get the damn candy. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so like, I mean, I've been in a situation where it was literally like we have X money, we need to pay Y money. Y is you know a fair bit more than X, and I literally was like, how the fuck are we gonna pay this? And I was just like, oh well. We'll figure something out and then they always did and i don't actually know how like this has happened to me so i guess there's always loans like maybe i don't know, I don't know. but yeah um, and 
again, we, we see, like, you know, they do this, and then they go to Harry's vault, and he's, like, trying to hide how much money he has because he's just ashamed. But we've already covered that whole thing. Also, um, if every student beyond first year has to buy, you know, eight books of Lockhart's, he's fucking, like... I mean, this is obviously, like, some... You know, this is a fucking scheme, like... But he's selling fucking 240 books just from the students. Damn. <laughs> Where are we getting 240? Uh, six of the years times four houses times... Uh, 10 students in each house per year group, right? I guess. <clears throat> I don't know. The, the number of students is always very debatable, but... I know. Either way. Yeah, dude's making bank. Um, <laughs> so they go around, uh, they specifically mention uh, Harry buying peanut butter and strawberry ice cream, which sounds good, I want that. Um, and they go to uh, Gamble and Japes Joke Shop. We never hear of this again. Um... <laughs> Because it, in uh, in Hogsmeade, we have Zonko's, which is, like, the go-to yeah. joke shop. But uh, we never see this one again. And I guess it gets replaced by uh, Weasley's Wizarding Wheezes eventually. Yeah. Then, yeah, they find Percy, like, fucking, again, jerking off over a, like, what was it, like, <laughs> like pre prefix who, like, who prefix who achieved power. <laughs> it's, like, the stupidest fucking yeah. book. Yeah, he's just because re- he he's like so pleased with himself being a prefect. He's like, man, what can I do next? And he just gets some book that is like, here's some prefect who did cool stuff after school. <laughs> after they left school. <laughs> yeah. Um. You have a note on this one. Yeah. So it's mentioned that Percy has like uh, aspirations to become the minister of magic, and this is one of the few things I think like you know who the minister is is one of the few things that like the canon continues to be updated like all the time so um <clears throat> I, well, not really all the time but like i'm trying to remember so obviously spoilers here that by the end of the series um the new minister for magic becomes uh kingsley shacklebolt uh and then you know that's 1998 and then like three years ago rolling announced that hermione became the minister for magic like in real time so she was like, yeah, as of now, 2019, <laughs> Hermione is the Minister of Magic. So that's still the case currently. And I believe, you know, if Percy was a real person, he would be like 46 years old by now. So we know he still hasn't become Minister of Magic. I wonder what he's doing now, if he still aspires to do that eventually. Because it's not like he's too old for it. You know, we get you get old yeah. heads to stay all the time. <clears throat> I wonder if he's in the ministry, like if he's still going for that. Yeah, because I mean, he was like the <laughs> assistant for a while and uh oh, yeah. i the, he has like a redemption arc in the seventh book because the ministry right. becomes like pure evil and he like finally kind of chooses his family over that but uh once it kind of gets cleaned up a bit i imagine he probably goes back yeah probably the, but, the uh, environment suits him <laughs> yeah so the rest of the chapter takes place in the bookshop and there's like not a whole lot specific worth mentioning here. I have here. Like, nothing it's, to say about, about this scene. Yeah, it's stuff happens. Yeah, it's like it's an important scene for setting stuff up. Um, yeah, you know, the, like ideological conflicts in wizarding society. We'll get to that. So yeah, basically, I, I guess I'll just kind of recap. Uh, so you know, we go into the shop. Uh, Gilderoy Lockhart is signing books. Molly's all flustered. Um, they keep making fun of her for that. <laughs> they uh. <clears throat> You know, they're trying to go in and get their books or whatever, and Lockhart spies Harry, and he's just, like, immediately, like, I, I, I can see the headlines now. Two celebrities happen to be at the same place. Smile <laughs> for the camera. And it's like, nothing happened here. Like, there's already a photographer, you know, taking a million pictures of Lockhart for whatever reason, I guess just because he's famous. And it's like, we're going to make an article. Oh, he did a book signing. <laughs> And it's like, oh shit, Harry's here too. Okay, and? <laughs> it's... Yeah, I mean, may- maybe the Wizarding World is just, it's so small and insular mm-hmm. that they just get no news, so they have to mix yeah. it up. Um, so, you know, he does that whole stupid bullshit where he's, he's like, together we make the front page. It's like, no, you don't. Um, but then he announces, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the new teacher, and it's like, oh... Right. Um, but, uh, 
whatever. So I, I love this bit here where like this is again this is nitpicking to such an extreme degree, but uh, like Harry is carrying like the whole stack of books that he was given. Um, he gives them to Ginny. He's like, whatever, I'll, I'll buy my own. He, like, dumps them in her cauldron. And then they mention, like, Ron also dumps his books in her cauldron. It's like, who's going to be carrying this thing? Like, you know, you're already saying, like, we're struggling with the weight of this stack of books. And we've got this big fucking metal cauldron. We're just putting all this extra weight in it. Like, what are you, what are you guys doing? Yeah. Um, but, uh, anyway, then the Malfoys come in and Lucius is a fucking asshole. Um, like, Draco's an asshole, too, because, you know, he's just like, oh, I bet you loved that, Potter. It's like, fuck off. Um, <laughs> Jenny finally speaks up. Um, we, we've seen her in the previous couple chapters, like, you know, squeaking a bit and, like, running away <laughs> and, like, sticking her elbow into I'm butter. I'm gonna run away! No, Benji Coon, you can't run away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, here she, like, finally actually speaks up and kind of defends Harry for a bit. Um, but yeah, so Lucius and Arthur, yeah, and Arthur kind of like have a standoff where they're just like, hmm, yes, you. And the th like, <laughs> we, we have this bit where, oh yeah, I also, I also pointed out every, like, once again, Malfoy is sneering and drawling. Every time he shows up, these are the adjectives used for him, <laughs> or verbs as the case may be. Um, but yeah, so. I think this is the only time we ever see Arthur, like, completely lose his shit. <laughs> like, I've, I've seen kind of pointed out multiple times in the fan base that, uh, you know, people always make fun of frickin' Albus Severus and all that shit, and it's like, why didn't Hagrid get somebody named after him? Or, like, and it's like, you know, you also have, like, people are always saying, like, oh, Sirius was... Um, Harry's, like, greatest, you know, father figure. It's like, no, Arthur's a really good dad, too. Like, you know, he's basically an adoptive father at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Like, the guy is great. He's basically everything you said earlier. But, um, yeah, this is the one time where he just kind of loses his shit and just fucking tackles Malfoy into, like, a bookshelf and causes this whole disruptance. And uh, it happens because, like, the thing that sets him off is... Lucius is just like, um, he like looks over at the, the Grangers and he's just like, mm, the crowd that you keep, I thought you could go no lower. And yeah, it, it really just kind of shows the difference in their character where, you know, Malfoy is just like, you know, muggles aren't even worth stepping on. And Arthur's just like, no, like they're great. Like there's nothing wrong with them. And I guess he just, was sick of dealing with it, so they fight, Hagrid breaks it up, there's basically no consequences, which is surprising, yeah. but kind of yeah. good. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody really got hurt, you know, they can they like can like magic the bookshelves major. back up. This isn't supposed to be like a major issue that has big fallout. It's, it's kind of just setting up, the again, the some of the themes of this book with, like, the, the difference between, you know, the wizards who are super, like, elitist about the blood purity bullshit versus, you know, the more to like open-minded it's not even open-minded it's just non-asshole ones that yeah pretty you know, much don't fucking hate muggles guts <clears throat> like. it's uh this is another thing where in uh in later books we see instances like uh there's a quidditch game in order of the phoenix where malfoy is being a cunt and it's like you know making fun of uh ron's family or whatever and they just I think it was, like, you know, Fred, George, and Harry, or maybe even Ron, too. I don't remember. It's, like, basically, they all just freaking tackle him, and they're just, they just start beating him up. And the book always makes a point of, like, this is muggle dueling. Like, this is below you. Like, you know, if you, y y they got so angry, they didn't even consider using magic. And <laughs> it, it's weird to me that, like, they make that distinction, but I guess it kind of yeah. makes sense. And that, that does guess. happen here is, you know, he gets mad and fucking tackles him. He doesn't, you know, shoot a spell at him. So. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. It's, but, we don't really have a comparison, right? Because it's like, uh, you know, wands are like this, you know, super multi-tool thing. In the previous book, I compared them to a phone at one point. They can be used as like, I mean, it's not even really a weapon here because you're not actually aiming to like kill them most of the time. It's just yeah. kind of, you know, hurting them, I guess. 
And there's no real equivalent of, like, at least I can't think of one, of, like, a quote-unquote weapon that is designed to hurt but not kill and is used... Yeah, it's like, you know, you have non-lethal stuff, but it would basically be, like, you know... People throwing stuff. Right. But even then, that's still just physical. Yeah, I don't know. Either way, mm. not a whole lot else to say about it. I just kind of wanted to point that out. And, uh... Indeed. Yeah, I think that's pretty much where the chapter ends, is, you know, they have their fight, Hagrid breaks it up, they kind of go their separate ways, and... Yep. Harry goes back to the burrow, and I guess that's it. Um, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it kind of just ends. A little, little bit of an anticlimax, but that's okay. A wee bit. So, I uh, don't know how to end this video. <laughs> oh, wait, we need to do comments. Okay. There weren't that many, but we will briefly do them. Uh, so we have one comment here that basically... Um, asked if we could like insert images a bit more often when we talk about visual stuff like for example we talked about the the full covers uh maybe we could do that this time just to if i have anything i don't know if we have any images really that need inserting what about the back and full covers i know people now can look too late. Up, yeah no I was just... <laughs> um and I then uh some somebody mentioned like the iron with the iron bars thing that, like, in a later book, Harry had to pretend that, like, the reason he doesn't go to, like, muggle school is because he's going to, like, a correction center sort of thing for, like, you know, problematic... Yeah, St. Brutus's... <laughs> oh, God, let me see if I can remember the name. It's, uh... Yeah, St. Brutus's School for Incurably Criminal Boys, I think. <laughs> um... Yeah, so... It's still a little bit questionable that Vernon would be okay with the bars in his house, but, I mean, I guess if he has an excuse lined up, then maybe. Um... And that then, excuse was specifically for Marge because she was coming over to visit. I don't know if they would say oh, yeah. that to like random neighbors. Sure. And then uh, there's like so they also mentioned something about the Great Hall where like it's enchanted to mirror the weather outside, which and basically asked should that count as whimsy? Because like why not make it out of glass? I don't know. I feel like it's. I think it's a little different because <laughs> like you know it, it's a type of thing where like you know let's say it's raining out. Um, obviously you don't want to have it just open to the ceiling, like, open to the sky, because then it would rain in, but if you had a glass ceiling, it would just be rain hitting the glass, whereas here yeah. I imagine it's, like, fake rain is coming down and kind of, like, you know, ending Simple right cast. above everybody's heads. Yeah. So, it, 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 it's like an extra effect, basically. It's just, right. it's to look cool, it doesn't do anything useful, but I, I wouldn't call that whimsy, it's just, you know, it's decoration. Yep. And uh, that's basically it. The rest of them were just kind of positive comments about being glad that the podcast is back, which, thank you, we appreciate the support. Yep. Hope you enjoyed this one. Yep, hopefully they will uh, not continue to take me four hours to take the notes. <laughs>